Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 244. Today's big Bible question, should we pray against our enemies? Well, happy Thursday, intrepid Bible Reading Podcast listeners. I'm not going to lie to you. Today, we encounter one of the literal weirdest chapters in the Bible. I'll just read them and you can decide. Well, actually, I don't have the patience for that. It's 1 Samuel 19, and wow, boy howdy, this chapter has everything you could ask for in a weird Bible chapter. Attempted murder. Actually, there's like there's like three attempted murders. Oath-breaking, family tensions, family treason, a daring escape by night, assassins prophesying, murderous kings prophesying. Actually, come to think of it, murderous kings prophesying while laying down naked and exposed the whole day. I'm not even kidding there. And the old switcheroo, this time involving a, (laughs) this is crazy, this time involving a household idol covered in goat hair and placed in a bed to make it look like David so that the assassins would try to kill the household idol. And by the way, why in the world does David have a household, household idol anyway? I don't know, but I bet you never heard that one before. Also, evil spirits tormenting somebody and hiding in a secret hideout. And honestly, there's probably more than that. You'd think with all of that intrigue and interesting content and strangeness, strangeness, 1 Samuel 19 would be our focus passage, but no way. I realize I'm a pastor and a daily Bible podcaster, but you know what? I'm scratching my head at 1 Samuel 19 just as much as you are. So maybe we can find, you know, like an oracle to ask about it, or maybe one of those really old and wise Bible guys like John Piper. Anyway, our Bible readings for the day include 1 Samuel 19, also Psalms 35, Lamentations 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Our focus passage is Psalms 35, and we actually do have a very thought-provoking question that probably not everybody will agree with my answer to. Should we pray against our enemies? Now, I'm asking the question because our psalm, and many more like it, opens up with a bold prayer from David asking God to oppose his enemies. So let's read it. Psalm 35, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Oppose my opponents, Lord. Fight those who fight me. Take your shields, large and small, and come to my aid. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers and assure me I am your deliverance. Let those who intend to take my life be disgraced and humiliated. Let those who plan to harm me be turned back and ashamed. Let them be like chaff in the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery, with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. They hid their net for me without cause. They dug a pit for me without cause. Let ruin come on him unexpectedly, and let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his ruin." Then I will rejoice in the Lord. I will delight in his deliverance. All my bones will say, Lord, who is like you, rescuing the poor from one too strong for him, the poor or the needy from one who robs him. Malicious witnesses come forward. They question me about things I do not know. They repay me evil for good, making me desolate. Yet when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer was genuine. I went about mourning as if for my friend or brother. I was bowed down with grief like one mourning for a mother. But when I stumbled, they gathered in glee. They gathered against me. Assailants I did not know tore at me and did not stop. With godless mockery, they gnashed their teeth at me. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their ravages. Rescue my precious life from the young lions. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will exalt you among many people. Do not let my deceitful enemies rejoice over me. Do not let those who hate me without cause wink at me maliciously. For they do not speak in friendly ways, but contrive fraudulent schemes against those who live peacefully in the land. They open their mouths wide against me and say, Ah, 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 we saw it. You saw it, Lord. Do not be silent. O oh, Lord, do not be far from me. Wake up and rise to my defense, to my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, Lord my God, in keeping with your righteousness, and do not let them rejoice over me. Do not let them say in your hearts, Aha, just what we wanted. Do not let them say, We've swallowed him up. Let those who rejoice at my misfortune be disgraced and humiliated. Let those who exalt themselves over me be clothed with shame and reproach. 
Let those who want my vindication shout for joy and be glad. Let them continually say, The Lord be exalted. He takes pleasure in his servant's well-being. And my tongue will proclaim your righteousness, your praise, all day long. So, should we still pray these type of prayers? Should we ask God to fight against those who fight against us? Now, Psalms 35 is a fairly mild version of what are called the imprecatory psalms. These psalms, Psalm 69 is a very famous one, often involve prayers for judgment, violence, and ruin for the enemies of God and the enemies of the psalmist. Some of those prayers for judgment and violence can be really quite extreme, to say the least. Should we quote these psalms against our enemies and pray these prayers from the Bible against those who do evil to us? Here's my answer. I don't believe we are allowed to do that anymore. Now, this is where you need to stop me and say, whoa, 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 hold on just a minute. Are you telling us we shouldn't do something that isn't in the Bible? And the answer is yes, I am. But I'm not telling you that on my own authority, but on the Bible's authority, specifically the authority of Jesus. And I feel pretty good answering a question on Jesus's authority, but I understand, and and you need to understand, I'm doing this with a little bit of fear and trembling because I'm telling you not to do something in the Bible, but that is because I believe the command of Jesus has superseded it. So check out Luke. 6, 27 through 36. Jesus says, But I say to you who listen, love your enemies, do what is good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. And if anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you. And from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. So that's pretty strong right there. And we also have passages like uh, 1 Corinthians 4.12. Paul says, when we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. Or Romans 12.17-19. through 19. We just read that a few days ago. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourself. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. We also have the example of Jesus forgiving his murderers on the cross and Stephen and Acts doing the same thing. 1 Peter 2.23, talking about Jesus, says, When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And there's other passages like that too. So here's the thing. I believe that we no longer ask God to destroy and judge and kill our enemies, but we recognize that Jesus is giving us a new commandment that supersedes or overwrites the old one in the same way that we no longer stone people for adultery or disrespecting parents, and in the same way that it is no longer a sin to wear clothing with mixed fabric, thus we no longer pray for the destruction of our enemies. Why? Because we're under a new covenant, not under the old covenant. Consider these three episodes of the show in the, that uh, we've already talked about how we're under the new covenant, not the old covenant. You can find the links to these three episodes, which is episode one, episode 15, episode 126, and an episode I forgot to number that was from July, so like 200 and something. Uh, you can find the links to those episodes on our website, BibleReadingPodcast.com. That's three fairly in-depth discussions of the question, should Christians obey the Old Testament and the New Testament, or just the New Testament? You can check that out. But let's close with some of Tim Keller's thoughts on another imprecatory psalm that actually would apply to this one too. This is what Pastor Tim Keller says. The other question is, why is it true in the New Testament we're told never to say the things David says right here? In verses 19 through 22, what does he say? He says, I hate those who hate you, Lord. I abhor those who rise up against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. They are my enemies. And Keller says, do you know the 
New Testament says we're never allowed to say that. In other words, we're not allowed to hate people. We're not allowed to say we hate people. We're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to do good to those who abuse us. We're supposed to pray for our enemies. So what happened between David and now with you and me that the Bible says you must never talk the way David talks in the Psalms right there? What happened? Well, you know what happened. David's greater son, Jesus, died on a cross, prayed for his enemies happened, and that is the answer to this riddle. And that's the reason we're not supposed to say the things David said, because David's greater son, Jesus, died for his enemies. So let's compare the two. Jesus died praying Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if you read, read the rest of Psalm 22, it's all about distance. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far off from the words of my groaning? Do not be so far from me, O Lord, do not be far off. The whole psalm is about a God who is far away. Here's David, and he can't lose the presence of God. He can't get far away from God. And here's David's greater son, Jesus Christ, and he can't find the presence of God. And do you know why? David knew because God had him by the hand, even darkness would turn to light. But Jesus knew because God had let go of his hand, Even the midday light was turning to darkness. He was plunged into darkness. David was knit together in his mother's womb. Jesus was torn apart on the cross. Why? Why did Jesus get the absence of God? Why did Jesus get torn away from God? Why did Jesus lose the Father's hand? He was getting what we deserve. You see, we try to get away. We try to live our own lives. We try to escape the inescapable, and that's wrong. What's the penalty? It's to get what we ask for, to be abandoned. Jesus was abandoned. He lost the presence of God. So if you believe in Jesus, you have the presence of God forever. He's got you by the hand and he'll never let you go, says Keller. Never. You know, friends, once you understand the good news of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the presence of God becomes a transforming, though edgy, comfort. What do I mean by edgy? Well, there's still an edge to it, isn't there? He's always with you. He sees what you're doing. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't say that. You should live consistently because he's there. There's an edge, but in the end, it's an infallible comfort because it doesn't matter how dark things are. It doesn't matter what you're going through. He has you and I by the hand. If some of you say, but everything's going wrong lately, well, maybe that's him actually making sure you come back to him. He's pursuing you. He's not abandoning you. I can tell you something. The worst times of my life, says Keller, was when I thought God was abandoning me, abandoning me, but I look back on them now and say, no, no, he was actually pursuing me. In Jesus Christ, he will never let you go. He has you by the hand. Even death will be just a nice night's sleep and all your darknesses will turn to light. There is no refuge from him. There is only refuge in him. Amen and praise the Lord. Let's continue with 1 Samuel 19. Buckle in your seat belts and I mean it this time. Saul ordered his son Jonathan and all his servants to kill David. But Saul's son Jonathan liked David very much, so he told him, My father Saul intends to kill you. Be on your guard in the morning and hide in a secret place and stay there. I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are and talk to him about you. When he sees, when I see what he says, I'll tell you. Jonathan spoke well of David to his father Saul. He said to him, The king should not sin against his servant David. He hasn't sinned against you. In fact, His actions have been a great advantage to you. He took his life in his hands when he struck down the Philistine and the Lord brought about a great victory for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. So why would you sin against innocent blood by killing David for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan's advice and swore an oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. So Jonathan summoned David and told him all these words. Then Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he served him as he did before. When war broke out again, David went out and fought against the Philistines. He defeated them with such great force that they fled from him. Now an evil spirit sent from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his palace holding a spear. David was playing the lyre, and Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear. As the spear struck the wall, David eluded Saul, ran away, and escaped that night. Saul sent agents to David's house to watch for him and kill him in the morning. But his wife Michal warned David, if you don't escape tonight, you will be dead tomorrow. So she lowered David from the window and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took the household idol and put it on the bed, placed some goat hair on its head, and covered it with a garment. When Saul sent agents to seize David, Michal said, he's sick. Saul sent the agents back to see David and said, bring him on his bed so I can kill him. 
When the agents arrived, to their surprise, the household idol was on the bed with some goat hair on its head. Saul asked Michal, Why did you deceive me like this? You sent my enemy away, and he has escaped. She answered him, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him everything Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel left and stayed at Nioth. When it was reported to Saul that David was at Nioth in Ramah, he sent agents to seize David. However, when they saw the group of prophets prophesying with Samuel leading them, the Spirit of God came on Saul's agents and they also started prophesying. When they reported to Saul, he sent other agents and they also began prophesying. So Saul tried again and sent a third group of agents and even they began prophesying. Then Saul himself went to Ramah. He came to a large cistern at Siku and asked, Where are Samuel and David? At Naoth in Ramah, someone said. So he went to Naoth in Ramah. The Spirit of God also came on him, and as he walked along, he prophesied until he entered Naoth in Ramah. Saul then removed his clothes and also prophesied before Samuel. He collapsed and lay naked all that day and all that night. That is why they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Well, there you go. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 1. Aleph. How the gold has become tarnished, the fine gold become dull. The stones of the temple lie scattered at the head of every street. Baith. Zion's precious children once worth their weight in pure gold. How they are regarded as clay jars, the work of a potter's hands. Gimel. Even jackals offer their breasts to nurse their young, but my dear people have become cruel like ostriches in the wilderness. Daleth. The nursing baby's tongue clings to the roof of his mouth from thirst. Infants beg for food, but no one gives them any. Hey, those who used to eat delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those who are reared in purple garments huddle in trash heaps. Wah. The punishment of my dear people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in an instant without a hand laid on it. Zion. Her dignitaries were brighter than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral, their appearance like lapis lazuli. Chaith. Now they appear darker darker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has been shriveled on their bones. It has become dry like wood. Taith. Those slain by the sword are better off than those slain by hunger, who waste away pierced with pain because the fields lack produce. Yod. The hands of compassionate women have cooked their own children. They became their food during the destruction of my dear people. Kath. The Lord has exhausted his wrath, poured out his burning anger. He has ignited a fire in Zion, and it has consumed her foundations. Lameth. The kings of the earth and all the world's inhabitants did not believe that an enemy or adversary could enter Jerusalem's gates. Maim. Yet it happened because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed the blood of the righteous within her. Noon. Blind, they stumble in the streets, defiled by this blood, so that no one dared to touch their garments. Samak. Stay away, unclean, people shouted at them. Away, away, don't touch us. So they wandered aimlessly. It was said among the nations they can stay here no longer. Pay. The Lord himself has scattered them. He no longer watches over them. The priests are not respected. The elders find no favor. Ayan. All the while our eyes are failing as we looked in vain for help. We watched from our towers for a nation that would not save us. Chade. Our steps were closely followed so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end approached. Our time ran out. Our end had come. Kof, those who who chased us were swifter than eagles in the sky. They relentlessly pursued us over the mountains and ambushed us in the wilderness. Raish, the Lord's anointed, the breath of our life was captured in their traps. We, We had said about him... We will live under his protection among the nations. Scene. So rejoice and be glad, daughter Edom, you resident of the land of Uz. Yet the cup will pass to you as well. You will get drunk and expose yourself. Tav. Daughter Zion, your punishment is complete. He will not lengthen your exile, but he will punish your iniquity, daughter Edom, and will expose your sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, called an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. 
that you are enriched in him in every way, in all speech and all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You are called by him into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by member of, members of Chloe's people, that there is rivalry among you. What I'm saying is this. One of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I did, in fact, baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't recall if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. For the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you were in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you, dear friends. May he keep you. May he protect you and cover you in his peace and in his grace in Jesus' name. Godspeed.